Welcome to Badgedamia, a podcast so educational two professors could be hosting it. Hi, I'm Dr. Danielle Dickenview, and joining me is Dr. Bill Pennyman. Welcome to Badgedamia. Uh, today we have a special guest with us, um, a UNI alum, Parker Aiden. Mm. Parker, yay! Yeah, did you graduate? Was it May 2019? Is that correct, or am I wrong? Yes, you are spot on. Yeah, so fresh out. So how is life post-graduation? Tell us what you've been up to. Oh man, it's been it's been interesting. <laughs> um, a little bit of up and down, but overall I'm feeling good and I'm doing well. Um, I moved back to my hometown because at, during my time in UNI, um, and I like to contribute some of this to the performance classes that I had. Um, but I discovered my passion was community development and kind of creative problem solving for that. So once I realized that and I recognized that my hometown is one of those rural towns that needs it, I've moved back home and I've been kind of just picking up contract work this year um, and doing a lot of different things in the community, kind of getting my name out there and building up my experience. <laughs> so it's been fun. That's awesome. And I know that you're a very that you're very good at building and creating community. So I know that Pocahontas will is lucky to have you. Um, funny story, like so Parker was in my classes, and I don't know how long you've been in one of my classes, and we realized that we had kind of a connection. So I grew up in a neighboring town, and his older sister and my younger sister we're like best friends. I'm like, my little wow. sister used to go play at his house. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I don't remember how he came to that realization, but I think one day I just came to class and I was like, hey, Danielle, did you realize? <laughs> so one of my favorite former students is from Pocahontas. Two of them, Megan and Mallory Furk. She watches our dogs, top-notch dog watcher. Uh, if you're ever looking for one, went to Pocahontas and was a grade above Parker. So... Oh, wow. Yeah, this is a real Iowa conversation. Like, a real right. Iowa. <laughs> they live off of Route 7. They, they have corn bins. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> take to get to their house. About two minutes because we never do miles in Iowa. We do time. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you don't normally know roads. You know, it's like they, oh, they live across the street from the blue house with yep. the white garage, you know? Yeah. So, By but yeah, house? yeah, the yellow house yeah. works great for colorblind folk like myself when people give me directions. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So, well, I'm really excited to have you here, Parker. Um, so each week we start out with a question and today's question is inspired by what I have now titled Bola Rama Drama. Um, and so do either of you have any good junior high crush stories so i was thinking about this yeah and it was i don't have like any i don't consider this to be a really good one but the most worthwhile one i have is i remember it was like the middle school dance and one the person i was like dating you know dating in middle school um left for some reason I don't remember why and I was really upset so then like I was just sitting in the bleachers not dancing and I was like if the DJ will play this certain song like I will come dance with all my friends so then all of them were like requesting it trying to get me out to dance and it was like an unknown song at the time so she didn't play it <laughs> but it was just what song was it? perfect it was find the beat by Sugarland I was big into them at the time okay I don't know why I wanted that particular song that evening but just prime like middle school drama right there in my mind. <laughs> I love Mine would it. have been like tub thumping by Chumbawamba. Like <laughs> Bill's gonna get out there. <laughs> so mine, uh, when I was in sixth grade, which actually is in junior high where I grew up, that was still elementary school, but it was like the spring before we graduated to junior high and the YMCA had a lock-in and it was like, both sexes were there so this was you know this was very scandalous and Casey uh, I won't use her last name um because I don't want to out her um 
as being a jerk, uh, said she would go to it with me as my girlfriend. And by the time we all fell asleep at two in the morning, she had dumped me and was now dating Brady. And oh. yep. Not so, Brady. Yeah. Ugh. Freaking Brady. Ugh. I don't know what they're doing with their lives, but I guarantee they do not have a podcast with at least 20 listeners. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Think about that, Casey. Who (laughs) did you end up with? (laughs) Oh, yes. This is our big take it for all those people that made fun of us. Mm -hmm. You know, I I was trying to think if I had a story because I feel like I told you all my best junior high story, which is that I got dumped after holding hands. Oh, yeah. Sweaty hands. I had sweaty hands. Um, Yeah. Real downer. But like when I wrote the question, I had this like memory triggered. I like remember having a crush on this boy who kept like this really good smelling cologne in his like locker and like thinking about it now that like this little, like little seventh grader you know is like putting cologne on every day is like the sweetest thing um and junior high kids kind of smell so like that was probably a good good play on his part but I don't know I just like had that weird memory of like I think that's the only thing I liked about him <laughs> I feel like all guys hit a point where they realize that you don't have to bathe in cologne. Like you just, if you're going to wear it, you put a little bit on, but junior high boys, it's like, they just like, how will they know that I'm a man if I don't smell of Axe body spray? So Dean Fritch, his son, Byron, who's now like in his twenties, but um, when I was an undergrad, Byron was in a performance with, us in the interpreter's theater and we were doing um dead man walking actually which is a great script um and he would like one time like you know dean fritch let us know that his son was like putting on cologne before rehearsals and he's like hey you know buddy what you doing and he's like i gotta smell good for the college kids (laughs) (laughs) which is like the sweetest but you're byron under the bus (laughs) <laughs> I did. I did. He was an awesome kid to work with. We also have like these stairs that go up um, right next to the theater in Lang Hall and he would climb on the outside of them. And I remember being like, Byron, like, what are you doing? He's like, tonight's the last night. I'm taking risks. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. um, yeah. So, okay. So I'll, I'll move to the bachelorette. Thank you for your junior high crush stories. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you had one word to describe this episode, what would your one word be? I went with cyclical. I feel like we're just in a loop now. Like things just keep like the guys make her mad. She kind of like gets pissed. Then the guys apologize and someone goes home. That's good. And maybe what? because also because of Claire. Like, I feel like we went through this with Claire and I just feel like we, we kind of need some type of change. Good. What do you think? I thought of melodrama on Tuesday night and that's the one I'm going to stick with. (laughs) Good. Why? Can you, I, I mean, well, so I had kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but I the like reality TV of my choice is big brother. And I'm like, die hard. We'll watch that all three nights of the week in the summer and like jumping to this because big brother obviously like there's a lot of material they get to pick and choose from and I don't know how much they have for the bachelor and bachelorette to do I mean probably a lot but this just felt a little more like scripted like some more scripted scenes than necessarily big brother because big brother I feel like you can't be acting all the time eventually you see people's walls fall down and so um, that was just the word that came into my mind afterwards when I was like, okay, so what's my word going to be to describe the episode? <laughs> good, good. I like that. Um, I'm going to break the rules a bit. I'm going to do two Uh-oh. words and say, Uh-oh. Bennett's back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this episode does pick up where uh, episode eight left off. So we start out this episode with Noah and Bennett. Um and, you know, Tasha ends up pulling Bennett aside. She's clearly miffed. Her facial expressions are the best. 
Um, and right away, she's like, Bennett, you're questioning my integrity. So what do you all think about this? Is she questioning her, his, is he questioning her integrity? I, I did to start out like that Bennett sat down and was like, where do we begin? And it's very pleasant. And I feel like if he was allowed to keep going, he would have been like, well, first off, I'm from Harvard. So I'm going to use some words that you don't know, Tasha. Um, and then she responded, like interrupt and said, let me start. And that's how you know she's angry. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And I don't know if I think Bennett's questioning her. I just think Bennett's kind of a jerk. Like, I don't, I don't know if Bennett is actively questioning her. I think to her, it's coming off as that. And so if Bennett really was interested in her as a partner, he should listen to that. But I don't think he has the self-awareness of how he impacts people to even understand that. Yeah, he seemed very condescending. For me, like not knowing him at all before this, the first like, the first impression for me was like, this dude is condescending. And like, she seems very nice. <laughs> Tasha seems awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's a jerk. <laughs> um, and, you know, but I did think that it was, I always find it interesting on this show when whoever's the bachelor or the bachelorette is sort of like gets mad at one of the, the contestants, I guess, um, gets mad at one of the contestants because they're questioning their judgment. And I'm just like, I mean, this person has also agreed to like, let you date multiple people. <laughs> so like, you know, maybe you want to just like, let it slide, but, but Bennett's a jerk. Um, let's roast Bennett. You got any good, have you seen any good Bennett roasts? So I just ventured into Reddit uh, recently, mainly so that I can promote this podcast. Um, so if you are any of our Reddit people listening, thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, but I, there's just a lot about him looking like Lord Farquaad, which I think he does from Shrek, um, or just being like totally un, like unaware of how much he just grates on people with his personality. Do, I mean, I'm like really curious what it is about him that she's even remotely attracted to. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, clearly he's not a bad looking guy by any means, but he talks and it really ruins it. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. Um, is it like the is it the bougie connection you know like that they're like is it the lure of i don't know his yacht i don't I, yeah so my friend uh, kim keeps saying like like she's just done with him so kim will be on the show next week she was a guest host um but she just said he is like all of so she lived in Boston for a while and she said he is like an east coast I went to Harvard she said he is like every conglomerated stereotype of that person that you meet on the dating scene out there you I don't get it you if I like men he wouldn't be my type <laughs> yeah yeah I just I didn't get a good impression of him and I don't think I have much as much else to add but so Connie, um, our friend Connie, who has also been a guest on here. Friend of the she, podcast. Yes. FOP. And she offered us an awesome hot take, which is um, Noah grew his mustache back like overnight. Um, and I thought that that observation was gold, but I, I know Bill has some feelings about this too. Well, I just, as a hairy guy, like, I mean, I started shaving when I was in sixth grade, which is probably how I got Casey. And then she realized that she didn't like bearded men. So she went with Brad, not bitter at all. Uh, I just wish people would appreciate people that can grow beards really quick because I feel like I would really start cleaning up, you know, like I'd get a lot more respect, which by the way, Parker, if you aren't watching this, Parker has an amazing beard. That was the first thing oh. I noticed about him when I rolled in here. It is no. <laughs> I feel left out, y'all. Like, yeah. 
Oh, this is a 2020 beard. It would not have existed if I wasn't living half of the year, like purposefully not going places. Cause <laughs> it, it took until at least October, September to like be full grown. But I've had friends that can just grow them in like three weeks. And it's like, wow, that's, I'm impressed, a little jealous, but also impressed. <laughs> I'll have to do a, I'll have to do an extra credit on hair and communication. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so even though Tasha does send, end up sending Bennett home, she also decides that she won't be giving Noah a rose at that time. She wants a little more time to think through things. Um, this causes Noah some anxiety um, as they move into the cocktail party. So the cocktail party, we start seeing, you know, little conversations that she's having with the other men. There's lots of kissy, kissy, kiss that happen. Um, so I think that you did a poll, didn't you, Bill? I did do a poll. Um, and the poll was, how many people have you kissed in one night? So um, not not being the uh, the same person, like not how many times have you kissed, how many separate people have you kissed in one night? Uh, about 50 people replied, 52 said they had kissed, 52% said they had kissed one person, 27% uh, said two, 6% said three, and 15% said four or more. So wow. there you go. I have my best friend in college, she would, she'd be able to make out with all sorts of guys in a night. I was so jealous. I was like, I can't figure out how to make out with one guy and you've made out with like five and I'm just sitting awkward in the corner still. Like, like was it a, was it like a mental block or like you just couldn't get a guy to make out with you? <laughs> Cause I feel like you're, you're like, I feel like guys are willing to make out with like anything if they get a couple drinks. <laughs> When I was single, I was, I like, so. I just didn't understand how to, I think all of that was very awkward for me. Okay. I, I was more likely to end up like, you know, debating politics with someone at the bar, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Parker, yeah. you want to add anything into this? I would be in the same boat as Danielle. <laughs> high five yeah I, just, yeah I had a point in college where I was just like you know what I'm gonna go big I I haven't been single I came into high school like dating someone we broke up and I like had a six month where I just just went just whatever yep. open, open season, season. <laughs> open season. yep I was like if you're willing to kiss me I'm willing let's get it done let's figure it out I was uh, the used car salesman <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What's so it? speaking of used car salesmen, one of the people that went home was Spencer. I feel like that could be a job of his. Um, so Spencer, Damar, and Ed ended up going home. How are you feeling about that, Bill? I just really like Ed. I just like, I like Ed in a, you know, He's a no, he's weird. I don't know. I just, I felt like they could have kept him on the show. He'll be back in Bachelor in Paradise, I feel like. Oh, yeah. He's too gold not to be. So the rose ceremonies are starting to become, I think, a little bit more intense. And at this rose ceremony, um, JoJo lets them know um, that they're going to be introducing some of the guys to take, is it to Tasha's family or to their family? Their family, I think. To their family, that's right, yeah. to their family <laughs> um, soon. So um, this like really sparks like an emotional reaction from some of the guys, especially Zach. Uh, so I guess thoughts about that, you know, is it a big deal for people to meet the family? Um, what kind of a milestone is this? I mean, I currently live at home with my parents. So even if I make just a new acquaintance and we're going to hang out, which doesn't happen <laughs> because of COVID currently too often, but it's like, I have a basement that where my friends and I will hang out and it's a separate space, but it's still like, you have the barrier of meeting my parents before like we reach that. So for me, 
not really that big of a deal, <laughs> but I can understand how it would be for some people. Absolutely. Is there like research on this bill? Do you know? Oh yeah. Well, I probably won't go too deep into it. Cause I feel like maybe next week that'd be an extra credit depending on how they all go. But I mean, you marry a person's family, um, you know, and so when you meet them the first time, obviously people kind of put on airs, they, they are putting their best foot forward. Um, but at some point, if you really have a relationship with somebody, you know, you're going to have to interact with their family in a way that is, um, meaningful. And so if you don't get along with their family, that's, that's kind of a big deal if they rub you the wrong way. I know Danielle, you spend time with your in-laws pretty regularly. Yeah, I tell everybody, every yeah, I tell everybody I have the greatest mother-in-law in the world. I mean, she's awesome. Um, but I don't, I can't imagine I've dated people where like, I just did not get along with their parents and like, yeah, it just, I can't imagine being married now to someone who I didn't get along with their parents. It's, it's not a good outcome. One of my ex-boyfriends, I'm still friends with his family, but I don't talk to him. I kept his <laughs> family and I ditched him, um, his sisters. So I like, feel like I was supposed to meet her. I just got sidetracked. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I do think that it's interesting, um, Parker, that you mentioned that. Cause I do think like growing up in a small town and when- Oh yeah. You know, in some ways, like meeting a family wasn't, you know, all the families kind of are know each other and they're more familiar. And it's just a slightly different thing than I think when I went to college or, you know, I've lived in other places where like, you know, when that relationship becomes more serious, that moment of bringing them to your home and meeting your family is a different thing. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that that's just something that I think is maybe a little bit different in rural versus maybe more urban spaces. Yeah, um, especially because here you could, you know, they run into each other at the grocery store and it's like, oh, oh, <laughs> and it might be the moment of, well, I know who that is, but I haven't officially met them yet. So, or it could be they know each other and then they stop and have a conversation. Yeah. Also how the two families get along is important. Um, so I'm lucky my mom and my mother-in-law get along really well, but I know there's some families where that does not occur. And that <laughs> is, then you throw kids in the mix and parenting styles and advice from parents. And you got yourself a cauldron of crazy that could really bubble over. Oh, absolutely. It's a joy. I think that like, <laughs> I think like that's one of the most interesting things for me was like, after we first got married, it was integrating myself into another family and realizing there is all these things that I thought every family just did. Yep. And all of a sudden I was like, oh no, that's just my family. I didn't, you know, I don't think I knew that some of my family culture was my family culture until I was introduced to another one, if that makes sense. So I have kind of an interesting story about that. Uh, so Elaine, um, our families are very different when it comes to Thanksgiving leftovers. So her family is very like, oh, take the food. We don't want to keep it. And my extended family, not my parents, but my mom's sister and brother, it is like a high level negotiation with hurt feelings if there is not a split and people don't get what they want. And so the first time Elaine was drug into that, she was like, oh, what is going on? This is not normal um yeah so my yeah yeah i could tell lots of yes that's a good story i like that i feel I, like we'll have an opportunity next week to talk about this too you bet so um after the rose ceremony it's announced that taisha is going to have her one-on-one -on -one with ben and so her and ben take off on their scooter scavenger hunt um Ben has on super skinny jeans, um, which, you know, yay and nay, interested in skinny jeans, not interested in skinny jeans. What's your thoughts? I grew up with Jinko jeans. <laughs> this is a bit of a shock. Hi. What do you think, Parker? <laughs> I was going to say, like, I don't even think I realized that that's what he was wearing, even though he took his pants off and then put them back on to get into the fountain. But Looking back on it now, it's like I didn't pay attention to that, I guess. 
I was concerned that how tight they were well yeah because like especially after you've been in the fountain like when you put jeans back on after being in the water like those suckers they I mean like that was probably a little awkward you know my mom my mother-in-law sue sent us an email uh batchadamia gmail.com if you have any questions um and she uh insisted that ben really wanted to show off and these are her words his junk. He seemed very excited to take his pants off and show off his junk. I promised her I would say that. Uh, so thanks, Sue. Um, I am a no for skinny jeans. In fact, one time uh, I was shopping and Elaine talked me into wearing them and I walked out and she just like doubled over cackling at how I looked. And so I've, I've got a mental block for it. I don't think they're comfortable. And apparently that's how old I am that I've given up on fashion and I'm like, I need something comfy. They definitely <laughs> are just, comfortable. I will agree with that. <laughs> give me them Skecher walking shoes and a pair of leisure pants. Well, women's like skinny jeans are nice and stretchy. Mm. So like I find them to be quite comfortable. So I don't know, maybe men's aren't the same stretchy material, but I mean, Ben did look okay in his skivvies. <laughs> um, he's then, gonna, yeah, he's going to look good in anything. It's not, yeah, I mean. And then so he he goes and he they break apart these pinatas, um, smash them apart. And I was, <laughs> so I really thought it was funny because I was seeing on Twitter all these memes. It's like, a, I don't know which Kardashian but it's one of the Kardashians and she's like pregnant and she's like, and now I'm pregnant. You know? <laughs> and everybody was like, Oh, him ripping, been ripping open that pinata and then posting and then I'm pregnant. <laughs> but like the funniest part is I wanted to share this with um, Bill and Parker. And so I tried to Google like <laughs> bachelorette pinata meme. And I didn't realize that I guess like, dick pinatas at bachelor parties is a thing and so penis I, everything at bachelorette parties are a thing right i yes i just didn't know that pinatas was an option i should have thought through that really i should have but so who knows what sort of searches are showing up on my work <laughs> oh did you do it at work well i mean i have a work laptop so nice yeah. <laughs> i like it but I feel like we can just tell them this is like part of our job and it was research. Absolutely. Hashtag academic freedom, get off our back. <laughs> Power to the people. Um, <laughs> so oh, one thing that I thought was interesting is that, you know, as they sit down, they, they start to have a pretty conversation, um, intense conversation and I would say intimate conversation and she kind of asked him, why haven't you opened up? And, you know, he says, you know, I don't want to share because I don't want to burden you. And I just, I thought that was interesting and something that I think a lot of people often feel um, that we don't always disclose information as a way to sort of protect another person. So I don't know. I just, you all have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I talked about this a little bit, but men tend to have, especially when their spouses die and in, in heterosexual relationships, they tend to have really bad outcomes because they rely almost solely on their spouse as their emotional support where women tend to have less negative outcomes. And so I think it's pretty on point for Ben to say that. And it probably... Um, suggest that men in general should think more about who do you who can you talk to and not feel like you're burdening and whether that be a counselor or if you get a best friend um but you know women do that very well in general find people that they can talk to and so they're not putting all the burden on one person where men are not great at that yeah yeah i got thinking like as he was telling the story or Ash before when she was like, I really hope he opens up to me. I was just like, it's not just him opening up to her. I mean, it is at first, but then like, it's going to go on national television. So no wonder it's harder for some of these people to, you know, 
do that because I couldn't imagine like telling a whole like you can I can talk to people about stuff but when it's a whole entire however many millions of people watch the show it's like <laughs> it's a little more daunting <laughs> yeah Danielle you and I text about that I think where I I kind of I think I said you know there's a part of me or maybe I had it and then I decided not to send it but on one end I feel bad that he's like basically telling the whole world that you know he had had all this these issues and um that's pretty vulnerable to put that out there but on the other hand i think it's good for people watching you know it's it's good to have that conversation um and put it out in the world and have people realize that there are you know men out there that have these things and you know young boys that can talk to people and um so yeah absolutely um and that sort of brings me to my extra credit right? for today. Whoosh, um, i set it up and the finger gun <laughs> um so before I do jump into this, I want to let our listeners know that I am going to be talking about suicide. So if that is not a healthy thing for you to listen to, I suggest that you press pause, move it forward for a little bit. Um, so last week, I think I mentioned on the podcast that when I went to college, I wanted to be a motivational speaker. And what I didn't say last week is that the reason that I wanted to do that is when I was in high school. So when I was between my junior and senior year of high school, I lost two friends to suicide and a third um, close friend of mine attempted suicide. So, um, <clears throat> which was a really impactful experience to go through at the age of 17. I think it would be at any age, but particularly then. Um, and so this is something that I care about quite a bit. Um, but I, you know, it's not something, my way of coping, I guess, when I go through difficult times is to research, is to read, to learn. And so I've done a lot of, I would say, informal learning on depression and suicide. Um, Bill probably has, I know he has more experience um, in formal education around this. Um, but so I wanted to share that story, one, to, you know, I guess I'm an overdiscloser, um, but also because um, I wanted to demonstrate sort of with language too. So how do we talk about suicide? How do we talk about things that have a stigma attached to them? So there's a lot of shame surrounding suicide. Um, and the way that we talk about things can either perpetuate that shame and stigma, or it can work to kind of press pause on that or distance us from that. So for example, when I just shared that story, um, that experience of mine, I said that I lost two friends to suicide as opposed to, I think if 10 years ago, I would have shared that I probably would have said I had two friends that committed suicide. Um, the word committed uh, is something that we oftentimes associate with sin. We might associate it with um, criminal activity. We might associate it to, um, we'll say that someone was committed. We oftentimes mean that they were put in a situation with, you know, beyond their will, I guess. Um, so I guess really quick lesson. There's a concept called terministic screens when we talk about language and it's this idea. So if you have a screen in your house, like in your window, in your door, it lets certain things in like air and um, sound, but it doesn't let in moths and bugs, right? So language is like that. Language can let certain things in. So when we hear a word, it lets in certain feelings and things like that, but other words direct us in different ways. So thinking about how we talk about these things to kind of question yourself and go, how can I talk about things in a way that removes the stigma, removes the shame, um, as opposed to perpetuating it. Um, and so one thing that I thought was really impactful about this, this moment on the show is that is just the act of sharing his story is pretty powerful. And 
Tasha's response, I think, is incredibly supportive. It's not shaming. It's empowering him for having taken the risk to tell his story. Um, I have some other things, but because of time, I do think that I, I want to, um, I'll share at some other time. But, but um, I do think the power of the personal narrative um, is really important. And if you're interested, there is an article I was going to talk about a little bit more called The Paradox of Documenting Suicide. So how do you balance this tension between um, sharing can be really therapeutic and empowering, not always, but it can be, um, but there's also the stigma. So you kind of have these two competing social pressures to both tell and to keep silent. Um, Anyway, it's a good article. It's a little bit old, um, but check it out. Um, also, uh, you know, I just want to remind folks that, you know, talking about suicide in an appropriate way will not cause someone to commit suicide. Um, uh, not talking can further isolation. So um, if you're having a conversation with someone who needs to talk, help them find support. Um, from a professional, and you can also call the Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. So that is my extra credit. Anything that you all, I guess, would want to add to that? If, if you're feeling, yeah, if, you're, if you are having thoughts about it, the only way that you are going to um, improve is by talking to somebody. Um, you know, you're not going to grit and bear it through it. I had a friend about two or three years ago who committed suicide and I was one of the last people to talk to him. Um, and it's still one of those things that I question why he didn't say something to me with my background. And it's something that bothers me constantly. And I still feel very um, onerous about. Um, but, you know, I also have to remind myself that if people don't say something, you can't help. And so, um, I would just echo what Danielle said. Uh, if somebody, uh, it, it, talking about it does not mean that you're going to put the idea in their head. If the idea is in their head, the idea is in their head. The only way to get better is to talk. If you don't feel comfortable, you can always offer to take them somewhere, um, take them to an expert, help them call the hotline, anything like that. Um, but action is the, the way to go. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Deep breath. Yeah, everyone take a deep breath. <laughs> so um, after this, you know. Now on to shameless sex. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? So it's time for the group date. Um, yes. The group date, oh, the lie detector. So um, general reactions to this date. What do you think, Parker? I didn't we like talked it. a bunch. Let's go, Parker. I, I don't know. I just didn't like it because I was like, "How do we know this things? Don't they normally have some sort of trained professional to like read a lie detector test?" Like, Jojo is that how not a trained professional. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, when those two are sitting there, and it's just, I'm pretty sure when you take one, it's not a matter of like you have two lights or three lights. I don't know why there were three. That confused me too. Because like, well, shouldn't one red light be good enough? Is that like you get both of them if you're lying really bad? <laughs> I don't know. But I was just like, this just, this is all for show. Like, you also can't answer like, maybe. There were a couple times where they're like, they're like, are you ready to marry uh, Tasha? I hope so. Like, I have watched enough Dateline to know that you do not get to like half-ass those answers you it's a yes or no um it also made me think of Maury Povich the where they would like you are not the father the lie yes. detector said you did cheat yeah yeah uh. it was it was a it felt very scripted to me it felt um one, I was just like so uncomfortable where it's like, it's all about honesty and trust. And then they're like, and now I'm going to catch you in a lie because <laughs> how you feel trust. Yeah. You know? So yeah, I was. It's the antithesis of trust. I feel like, like trust is at its core, 
like trusting that they're going to tell you the truth, not like, and now I'm going to see if you did it or not. And forced forced disclosure, I'm not a fan of, right? You know, being an over disclosure myself, I like, I willingly offer up that information. I would never expect other people to like, have to meet me there. Right. Right. So, um, I think this sort of like forced, I'm going to ask you a question and you're in a situation where like, you have to answer. It makes me a little squeamish. Um, so Bill, Ooh, you yeah, have an extra Mike... credit. <gasps> That's my new move. I made that up. So let's talk a little bit about trust, honesty, and lying. So first question is, why do we care about trust? Why? Uh, I think the core, the first question we, you know, we should be asking is, why are they even doing this? Um, inherently, we kind of know that trust is going to increase intimacy, right? So we are hardwired not to trust people who we um, are not to create intimacy with the people that we don't trust. Um, so what do we know about lies? Uh, most of us do lie uh, at least once a day, about 70% um, is what we find. I feel like the other 30% are liars because I think most of us tell some lie during the day. Um, most of the lies we tell though um, are small, they're self-preserving. So they're gonna be something that wards off embarrassment, guilt or obligation. Um, I call them or, or they're to, told to help another person's feelings um, or your feelings. I call them the taco salad lie. Uh, so if anyone's not familiar with the taco salad, it is basically just nachos that you have like kind of mixed up and put into a salad form. Um, you get a lie to yourself and say you ate a healthy salad. You also get to eat nachos. Um, no one's hurt. Everyone feels good about it. Um, so about a fourth of the lies that we tell are to protect someone else's feelings, um, and usually our partners. Um, so, you know, we want to make them feel good about themselves. We understand that there is this bigger picture. And so being brutally 100% honest all the time does not increase intimacy either. Um, We expect people to lie about their appearance on dating apps when it comes to just dating. Um, Men, we also find lie a lot about ambition and money. Um, Women tend to lie about um, how much they enjoy sex. So fake orgasms are a thing, which I thought was kind of funny when they asked Noah and he's like, no. And it was like, yeah, no, Noah. Um, Both tell lies that appeal to the other sex. Um, Most lies in close relationships we find are benevolent. So again, we're trying to make our partners feel better with those lies. So uh, maybe we pretend that we are more attracted to them than we are at that moment. Now, not saying all the time, but in the moment, we do things to make them feel better. So if you think back to one of the first episodes, we talked about um, the uh, love languages. If we know that one of the love languages is they like to feel liked or or something like that. We lie a little bit to make them feel better. Um, So about 97% of partners have lied to their partner in the last week, but most of them are those benevolent lies. There's about 7% of people who uh, are what we call prolific liars and they tell the big lies like money mismanagement, infidelity, things like that. So the nice thing about it is most people are honest for the most part. And when they tell a lie, it's to make you feel better. Um, So how do lies impact our relationships? Uh, Those who lie more are tend to tend to suspect people of lying more. So there's kind of this weird interactional thing where if I lie, I just assume everyone else is lying and that I do that to make myself feel better about myself, you know? Um, uh, oh, I lost my place. Liars tend to rate their lies as less impactful. So there's also this uh, personal bias where if I tell a lie, I think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But then if that lie is told to me, um, I think it's a much bigger deal. So we kind of self-serve. Um, people tell a good amount of lies in intimate relationships and they get away with them. Um, so we are pretty bad at detecting lies. We're also cognitively uh, pretty lazy. So Sometimes our significant others tell us stuff and our bullshit meter goes off, but we're like, you know what? It's just life's too hard. Uh, And Danielle, you've been married. I've been married, Parker. I don't know your status, but I feel like you get to a point in relationships and you're just like, whatever, fine. I'm not even going to investigate that. You, however it makes you feel. Um, (laughs) And then happy relationships. We find people tend to let lie less, but um, 
they also tell those smaller lies. Um, and they become good at knowing when's a good time to tell them and when's a good not. Um, so to wrap it up, you've lied. How can you get out of the doghouse for lying? Um, what is the anatomy of a good apology? And I've talked about this before, but I'm going to say it again. Admit you were wrong. Um, before you're caught, if possible, what we find is that it is much better to admit that you've done something wrong and then ask for forgiveness than to get caught and beg for forgiveness. Um, show contrition. So what did you do? How did it impact the person? Um, that's really big. And then accept responsibility, excuses, and even giving context, which you see with Bennett. He's trying to give context and it's like, I don't think Taisha wants that. She wants him to say, I was a jackass. I am sorry. And he's not going to do that. Um, and then explain how you'll change. So how am I going to improve? What am I going to do next time? So, and that is my extra credit. Good work. We're so smart about lying now. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually in the book I use, which is intimate relationships, there is a little like box that they put in textbooks and it's like how to get away with a lie. <laughs> and it's ways to, so I decided not to do that. I'm a storyteller. And if I need to like fudge things just a little bit to make a good story, I'm in. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like in, class, you know. in class, I will, I will stretch the truth to make a good, a good story. Yeah. Don't let truth get in the way of a good oh. story. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. So then like, um, after the lie detector shenanigans, we moved to the evening part of the date. Um, Tasha's wearing something that looks like a wedding dress. Um, and then Zach sits down and he, you know, she says, Hey, you cheated. Tell me about this. And it is like such a set up, such a setup. Should have been a trigger warning for me. Like they should have said, this is going to bring up your sixth grade romance bill. You're just going to be angry for two days. Oh. At Casey and Brady. Oh my goodness. I yeah, see. it was a total setup. I thought it was ridiculous. Uh, but though, then she tells Zach that she's in love with him. And this is like, it's, it was I, the first oh, time I watched, I almost... Him. Yes, falling in love with him. Yeah, because I don't think they can actually say I love you. Like I, I think I read that there's like a contract that's like that's a like the the primary can't say that. Well, you know, it was even a big deal, I think, that she said that she was falling in love with him, especially this early. And it was interesting to me because I almost missed it the first time. And the second time, you know, I I was so aware of it. Um, because it kind of just slipped in there because I was so like listening to the Volarama drama story. So, um, but yeah, this is like a sort of a breach of how things work on the show. So yeah, I don't know. I think she's, she's got it bad for Zach. Our COVID watching pod can't tell the difference between Zach and Brendan. Like they look a lot alike and I think she's got a type and it's that. Yeah, I, I can, it's interesting to me. That's not what I would have guessed going into the show. what do you think, Parker? I just feel like it's hard to go from, cause they kind of built up the whole, like he cheated. I'm going to have to ask him about that. That is like a hard, like, no, for me, you don't do that. And then he tells a story and it's like, oh, this is just like a little kind of gag from sixth grade, like, ha ha. And then she's just like, oh, you're so funny. Like, <laughs> and it's like, if that's one of your worst things, how do you go from like being super upset to then just like, I'm, I'm falling for you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. For me, it didn't make sense, but. Is she getting a hard yes for anyone? That's what I wanted to know is like, is anyone out there and they're like, I like cheating. I want to find someone who infidelity is their calling card. Like, I feel like they say it a lot and I understand why, but there's a part of me that's like, it really doesn't need to be said. You don't need to be like, I hate when people cheat on me. <laughs> yeah, if, if monogamy is the agreed on deal there, then like, that's right. probably the arrangement. Well, yeah, but then it's not cheating, right? If you, if you have an open relationship, it's not cheating. That's your agreement. So I, I guess I just feel like, yeah. uh, like really what they should say is it bothers me when people um, do not, 
honor what our agreement is in our marriage. Like, but just being like, cheating is horrible. It's like, yeah. You would and didn't he, cheat. in the lie detector test, like he fessed up and he was like, yes, I have cheated, right? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it have, I mean, they should have just been like, nope, and then let the lie detector, because then they could have built it up even more. But instead, oh, they were yeah. truthful. And I think that it was a risky move on his part to say that, not offer anything. And then it actually made me question whether the sixth grade story was it. I, that's what I thought. I thought like, was he like, like actually, you know, like my last, cause he was the one with the drug problems, right? And like, that is a predictor of infidelity in the research is that if you have a drug problem, you're more likely to have infidelity in your marriage. Yeah, so. That makes sense. So we move on from there to um, Riley. There's um, really an intense story about his family and, you know, him processing what it might be for Tasha to meet his family. Um, side note, I just, I really appreciate the way that Tasha listens to the men. She's so attentive. Um, I think that part of the reason that we're probably getting the stories that we are this season is because she invites telling. I mean, she's very invitational and she's such a good listener. I feel um, like you should do an extra credit on that at some point, like yeah. listening and being a good listener and inviting that. Yeah, I could totally do that. Do you have research on that too? I have a little bit. I mean, other, I have than, thoughts. other than if you want people to be open, you better make sure that when they open up to you, you... <laughs> you receive it well. Absolutely. I did take a listening class with Karen Mitchell my final year. And that was honestly more eye-opening than like you expect it to be when you enroll in a class called listening. And you're like, okay, yep, I can do this. <laughs> but she did a really great job with it. God, I love it. Yeah. It makes my administrator heart just, just sore when I hear students say they like a class. Karen's <laughs> awesome. She did a lot of mindfulness and what it, sort of like connecting mindfulness to listening to, didn't she, Parker? Yeah, she did. And I remember like we had a probably about a month. It was like a one of the pillars of the class was doing courageous conversations and like practicing that. And she like some of those were so funny because she was playing like just the jerk role to a T. <laughs> and but then there were other times where she like, you know. Karen's great at acting so she was able to really like you felt like you were actually practicing those conversations um but yeah I do remember from that class I don't remember the statistic but she had one of like the thing that people don't pay attention to is like how people are feeling so someone will like confess whatever and you acknowledge their feeling of like it I'm hearing that you're frustrated or I'm like, these are the feelings that you're like, that I noticed. And literally just acknowledging that is Mm -hmm. one of the biggest things. Yep. And Tasha did that really well um, on multiple occasions. Um, You and I students, if you're listening, do you have the prefix for the class? Oh, I don't know. We'll put it. I don't. We'll put it in the listen notes. That's great. I'll find that for you. Bill. Okay. So she ends up not giving out the group date rose. Um, And right as she's leaving, boom, Bennett returns. (laughs) And then he tells her that he loves her. Oh, man. That whole thing. Oh. He's gone. He's gone on a real, like, I, I wrote this in our notes, like this season, he's gone from like, cartoon of a rich douchey guy to like witty (laughs) observer to entitled douche to creepy entitled dude who doesn't understand how a person couldn't want him and I was very (laughs) uncomfortable when he tried to kiss her twice (laughs) and like she shot him down both times like it was bordering on like you know this is like I feel like a producer should have stepped in and been like okay hosed him down (laughs) cold water Parker, what did you think, like, having just, like, stepped into the show this episode? Don't, my, well, my first thought was, don't they normally wait longer until they come back? Like, <laughs> it's not literally the same episode they leave. 
And also, why does he like? Why is he the only one that gets to do that? Why do they allow him to do that? Uh, I mean, I think when he said that he loved her, like it felt so manipulative to me. And I mean, it it just felt like I'm gonna like do whatever I need to do to stay on the show, um, in a way that, well, all of that I was so uncomfortable with. And then I just couldn't believe that she let him stay. Like I was just waiting for her cause she can assert herself when, when she wants to. And so I was just like waiting for her to be like, mm, no, like yeah. I made my decision, take them feet in the <laughs> expensive shoes and get out of here. Like With no socks. Yeah, that was something I noticed. A lot of them apparently just are not believers in socks. I have such smelly shoes. Maybe it's a fashion trend we're just not up on. It yeah. could be. It was really hot there, I guess, when Damn they filmed it. Needs. I did also notice that is like all, which I would be drenched in sweat too, because oh. I am usually that way. But they were all just like glistening. <laughs> I want Bennett back because I love train wrecks. And that is why I watch reality TV. I know, Danielle, you've said that you like a good love story. I am, Danielle's making hard hands. I like to see people cry. Um, I like breakups. And, but if I was her friend, I'd be like, he got to go. Like there's nothing good comes from this. But, so at least we don't have to end on the frustration of Bennett. We do get like this hilarious clip Yes. With Ed and a face mask and it's glorious. He got the send off he deserved, I feel like. Do you have closure now, Bill? I mean, I'm approaching it. I don't know what the stages of Ed detachment are, but I'm close to closure. So if you had to name your biggest takeaway from this episode, what would it be? What's the life lesson you need to take with you? <laughs> Tasha, uh, she's got much more assertiveness than I give her. Like she is a good example of being able to tell people to go to hell, but do it in a way that I'm like, I support her. I might not agree with her. Like, I feel like her and Claire are very different people and they both stand up for themselves and I'm fine with that. But I feel like she is very, like I'm, I've, been very impressed with her like I thought she was just going to get pushed around by the guys but she yeah it's great I did get a really good impression of her too again not having like watched any of this season or really any sort of bachelor bachelorette show up until <laughs> for however many years um but she within the first 10 minutes had earned my respect and I was a fan of her and hoping that she could you know, find the right guy through this. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe this is just coming off of the conversation we just had, but I guess my takeaway is to listen to people that everyone has a story. And um, if you're willing to listen, they'll, they'll probably share it with you. So. Um, Way to be the adult in the room, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's got to be that's that's how people normally explain explain me. <laughs> yeah. Danielle she's the mature one <laughs> um, no um I do want to remind our listeners that next week there's back-to-back -back episodes so we get we get twice as much bachelorette next week but we will only have one episode of, of the podcast yeah right yeah so, but we will cover what we can cover we are gonna cram it in there you bet <laughs> So Parker, thank you so much for joining us today. Is there anything else that you, would you like to leave us with anything? Last, last word, Parker. <laughs> Ugh, this is anything, so much pressure. Anything you want to promote? Anyone you want to shout out to? I mean, if you are, if you go to you and I, or you're looking at what colleges to go to, like take some communication studies performance classes because those were the ones I enjoyed the most and I felt like impacted me the most. They're a different type of work compared to just, you know, flipping through a textbook and getting test answers crammed in your brain. It's a lot more challenging. And those are the ones where I made my, a lot of friends that I still keep in touch with. So take some performance classes. Oh, Parker, you're the best. I give you a big hug if we weren't on Zoom. 
<laughs> get in trouble for being late to our next meeting, Danielle. I'm going to be like, listen, yeah. we just did a PSA for the university. Get off our back. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Parker. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Have a good weekend. You've been listening to Batchadamia with your hosts, Drs. Daniel Dick McGew and Bill Henniger. All opinions expressed on this show are solely the opinion of the person who spoke them. If you like our podcast, please consider following us, leaving us a five-star rating, and a positive review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, please share with your friends, family, and other ardent Bachelor content lovers. If you have comments or questions you would like us to address on the show, you can email us at batchadamia at gmail.com or on the Twitter with the handle at Thanks for listening.